gonna just do a quick intro. Um, this year, we've seen the largest civil rights protests and racial uprisings since the death of MLK in reaction to racialized police brutality in all 50 states and many in our spark cities and neighborhoods. It's left us with questions on how we can feel safe and be safe getting around our neighborhoods and communities, going to work and coming home. It forces us to recognize that what means safety to one community can really be a historic danger to another. And as we think about the broader context, about the impacts of COVID on our communities and transit agencies. Um, we'll hear more about LA from our speakers, but in reading Ayan's paper, I really thought about this fact that the LA Metro carries over a hundred million passengers each year. Most of these riders are low income, but about 85% of those riders are people of color. So when we ask, what does safety mean for the people who take transit now? we're really asking about those who rely on it. What does it mean for communities of color, for black and brown folks, for women identified folks, for LGBTQIA plus folks, essential workers and transit workers who are keeping our city running so many of us can stay home? How are we working to keep them safe? So our really amazing Spark site partners have chosen to focus on the transit system because it's so deeply integral to daily life and opportunity access for our communities. This year has forced us to really redefine safety and be honest about who our transit spaces are designed for and for whom they are not. This conversation presents us with an opportunity to really reimagine what transit safety means for our individual communities and work towards a transit system that can truly help us all thrive. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and kick us over uh, to Mayan. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today on this call. I have some slides to help um, guide the conversation a little bit and make sure I stay on topic. So um, I'm, I hope everyone can hear me. I can see some of the, okay, great. Um, so like Ella mentioned, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about alternatives to policing. Uh, this is based on research that I did on behalf of the Alliance for Community Transit, uh, LA, who Laura is a part of the organization. And it's really just looking at what are alternatives to policing. Um, okay, so I think it's important to start kind of first with this bigger picture around why are we even talking about this, um, just because it helps to really hone in on some of these issues at hand. So ultimately, um, this whole conversation centers around safety and really reducing or limiting the amount of crime that's on transit uh, in, a, in order to maintain or at least increase ridership. And when we're thinking about crime on transit, um, really this kind of comes down to just changing people's behavior and giving them certain nudges to deter crime from even happening in the first place. And so traditionally, this is done through armed law enforcement. And I think that there's a long-standing association of policing and crime reduction. But for reasons that I'll be going into in this presentation, um, that's not always the most appropriate way to address that. And so that kind of leads to this research question of what are these alternatives that can help to change people's behaviors and limit or reduce crime on transit? And are they effective? And so I think it's helpful to think about the kind of framework around policing that we see right now. And this is a, like a framework that's been posited by a few legal scholars looking at the role of police. And police mainly play two roles in society. The first is investigative policing and the second is preventative policing. And investigative policing, that refers more to things like taking um, witness accounts, fingerprints, having access to private information that because of police officers, uh, state sanctioned authority, they're able to access. On the flip side, we have preventative policing and preventive, preventative policing is uh, more around visibility and having a police officer visible in order to deter crime, in order to prevent crime from happening. And so on transit, we largely see preventative policing. This is the kind of thing where in contracts or in scope of work, um, the emphasis is on visibility and on staffing as opposed to being able to like address theft issues on transit. And so now that we kind of have this framework about policing, it's really important to talk about safety because safety is something that's so abstract. 
Um, and in safety, there's two things that are important to consider. The first is actual safety, and the second is perceptions of safety. Actual safety is related to crime rates. What's the, the chance that some crime will happen to you if you're in a given place? And the second um, kind of idea here is perceptions of safety. And actual safety rates don't really influence our behavior. It's part of how we perceive a place to be safe, but perceptions of safety are really the key factor in how we, we act in a certain space and how we feel in a certain space. And like I mentioned, perceptions of safety is something that's different for every single person. Um, it's largely influenced by your, your race, your ethnicity, your class, your gender, um, sexual identity, previous experiences with trauma and with crime, and also environmental factors. And so things like if a driver will help you board a bus safely, or, oh, oops. Way. Um, if someone will hurt you because of how you present your gender, gender identity, Sorry. Um, if someone will assume that you're from a rival gang in an adjacent area, if that person coughing has COVID-19, if there are ICE agents at a station looking for people who are undocumented, if the person who assaulted you two months ago is on the train, or if it's just really dark and you can't see what's going on in the actual station itself. All of these types of factors and questions are what really influence perceptions of safety. And so I, I kind of just wanted to illustrate how expansive um, this notion is and what can be considered safety when we're thinking about perceptions. And this last point around lighting really touches on environmental factors, which play a really big role in how a space is perceived. And that can range from lighting, like this example shows, to station cleanliness, um, and other sorts of environmental factors. And something can, to consider is if, um, if law enforcement are in the environment as well, that influences how a space is perceived. And law enforcement who are racially profiling people in traffic stops are the same people that are then picking up overtime shifts to police transit systems as well and are also engaging in those types of discriminatory practices around fair evasion, as well as code of conduct violation. And this isn't anything new. This is something that transit agencies already know and have heard many, many years. Um, this is a quote from the How Women Travel Study Appendix E um, that was commissioned by Los Angeles Metro. And uh, this was through focus groups that this information was found out that numerous participants, in particular people of color, shared that they had been unjustly targeted by law enforcement and that they do not always feel more secure with armed law enforcement on buses, trains, or platforms. Over and over, participants in the workshops and pop-ups pointed to problems that could be solved by a deeper investment in non-law enforcement staff on Metro. And it's not just in this focus group that we see these kinds of dynamics play out. Indeed, and this is from my research paper, prior research is inconclusive on the effect of transit police on improving state safety, and even more so when considering people's perceptions of safety and different socioeconomic standings. Right now, most of the research that exists does not parse this information out by race or by class. And as we know, different people are treated differently by police officers. And so it's incredibly important when we're thinking about how we want to make our public spaces safe to be looking at things through this type of lens. And so with this kind of baseline, baseline information and groundwork in mind, um, I'd like to share with you some of the findings from uh, my research on alternatives to policing on transit and highlight some of the different case studies that I included um, as potential options for providing safety and security services without the use of armed law enforcement. So the first thing I'll talk about um, is transit ambassadors. These, uh, these types of programs are in place at SF Muni and BART and also uh, the New York City MCA. SF Muni and BART are more formalized programs and I also looked at uh, the New York City MCA's Guardian Angels program which was a volunteer program as a way to kind of see it, just a different program and how it was structured and what were some of the impacts of it. So um, transit ambassadors by and large are unarmed agency staff and they're the ones that are in this high visibility yellow vest at this station. Um, they're trained in de-escalation and conflict resolution and management and by and large their task is to kind of reduce fights, um, 
call out bad behavior essentially, but they don't really necessarily have powers of arrest and citation like armed law enforcement do. Hey, Mayan, would you mind slowing down a tiny bit? I just want to make sure translation can keep up. Thanks. Yeah. So these types of programs are really popular with operators who are able to do their job better um, with these folks in place as well as elected officials. Many programs um, like uh, BID or Business Improvement District Community Service Officers are also based off of this type of model. And, and these programs are also um, effective. In, in New York City, uh, the Guardian Angels program reduced, or in, sorry, increased perceptions of safety among transit riders. Um, the BART program is relatively new, so there's no data around it yet, but in SF Muni, um, this is kind of where this, this piece comes in, that it's, it's really popular among operators and heavily requested by them as well. I'll also talk about elevator attendants, which are pretty similar in concept to transit ambassadors. Um, this is a photo of one on BART, and again, it's just an unarmed presence, staff presence, in an elevator. Um, these elevator attendants, one in BART, it stemmed from a desire to improve the conditions in elevators. And in New York, they're actually just a relic of um, formerly hand-cranked elevators. And at BART, at least, a local nonprofit staffs uh, these elevator attendants. So they're reflective of the communities that are riding transit and that the stations are located in as well. Uh, additionally, these elevators are staffed around 21 hours per day from 4 a.m. to 1 a.m. And the results really speak for themselves. Um, this was a survey done on BART of customer satisfaction of elevator facilities. Prior to implementation, only 44% of folks were satisfied with elevators. And after implementation, 93% of people were satisfied with the condition of the elevators. And so what this tells us is that, one, these elevator attendants are popular with people, but they also make the elevator, which is a, con a confined space, very safe for riders too. And the New York City example really speaks volumes as well. The fact that these positions were basically irrelevant because of advent of um, mechanical elevators, and yet they still stayed on because community members and the union fought really hard to save these positions because they saw them as improving safety on these elevators that have really long kind of journeys deep underground. The next thing I'll talk about is outreach to people experiencing homelessness. And here I'll, I'll discuss a case from LA Metro, but I think that this is an important topic to discuss because homelessness is an epidemic throughout the entire country. And it's something that many transit agencies are realizing they have a role to play in as people take shelter on transit, as it's a safe and dry and warm space. So right now, LA Metro mainly has two different ways of addressing um, homelessness on transit. The first is through a series of outreach workers and PATH, People Assisting the Homeless, is the nonprofit that has been contracted out to do this. And the second approach is through armed law enforcement, where different uh, police agencies that have safety and security contracts with Metro are uh, tasked to provide outreach as well through different departments that they have specifically around uh, issues relating to people who are experiencing homelessness. So these are- Hey, Jolanda. Um, I am having a problem with my R drive access. Do you- Heather, could you? Thank you. Uh, so the, with armed law enforcement, there's, um, there's a few different ways that this happens through mental evaluation units and um, uh, ho homelessness outreach and prevention engagement or something like this. So I wanna draw your attention to this uh, chart that's a little bit intense. So on the first, uh, the first kind of topic, we have the percentage of contacts that received housing. So looking at um, these PATH teams and the police agencies, if we see uh, the number of each contact that has been in touch, for example, with a police agency or with a PATH team, um, how, which percentage of that received housing? And housing here could mean shelter, uh, long-term housing, or permanent housing. So for every 
only one contact out of 100 people that the police agencies come into contact with is able to secure housing. The flip side of that is these PATH teams, where 27% of the people that they come in contact with, they're able to provide some sort of housing for. And when we're looking at services, which is a much more expansive topic, that second topic, that relates to healthcare, benefits, uh, welfare, doctor's appointments, etc. Here, the police agencies are able to secure services for 28% of the people that they're in touch with, while the PATH teams are able to secure services for almost half of the people that they're in touch with. And in this example, the amount of staff that are um, on PATH and the amount of staff on, through police agencies are pretty similar and their cost is really similar as well. However, when we look at the efficacy of one versus another, one is accomplishing its goals much more than the other. And so this, I, this concept of cost effectiveness then is really put into play when we see these different approaches to addressing homelessness on transit. I want to also point out a third approach or another approach that was taken by SEPTA. This is the Southeast Pennsylvania Transportation Authority, um, where a social services center was actually built into a train concourse in one of the central uh, city locations. And so, as I mentioned, this is an in-station acute social services center called the Hub of Hope. And this was done through a partnership with a, non, a local nonprofit, the city of Philadelphia and SEPTA. And in this location, um, folks are able to receive housing placement, medical services, laundry and shower services. There's hot meals that are also served, as well as drop-in support groups too. So it's really kind of this very over, overarching holistic um, place. And through an interview with Eliza Manju, who's the assistant program manager, uh, she mentioned that at the Hub of Hope, we aim to meet people where they're at and get them what they need. And so I wanted to kind of provide this as a counterexample to um, really, instead of sending social workers through a disparate uh, network of transit, services are consolidated into one location that's easily accessible through transit as well. The next thing I'll talk about is public art interventions. Um, this, these were in Bogota and um, in Mexico. And um, the first one is in Bogota. This was uh, a group of mimes that were brought in to curtail traffic uh, collisions between pedestrians specifically and vehicles. Um, pre prior to these mimes being in place, there was a network of traffic officers who were ticketing people uh, and largely pocketing fines. And so the mayor at the time, Antonis Makis, put these mimes in place as a form of popular education and of making the, this kind of experience more joyful and playful. And indeed, over a course of 10 years, collisions were reduced almost by half. Um, from 1,300 to 600. And so we see the, the power of public art here to, to really change um, street dynamics. And inspired by this, um, a group of college students in Mexico City uh, wanted to do something similar, but in the subway. And their, their main concerns in the subway were these kinds of, um, what they called points of, essentially points of conflict. Um, so where people were trying to get onto the train before other folks exited off of it, Folks were walking um, kind of in, a, in an opposing way down a staircase along against like the main flow of traffic and people weren't giving up their seats to folks who needed them. So these, uh, this group of college students, they actually first tried to be referees, but um, whistling at people and um, kind of escalating a situation wasn't really working and they weren't receiving the kind of uh, feedback they wanted. So instead they turned to clowns, which was a more non-confrontational humorous approach to this problem. And you can kind of get a sense for, um, for their vibe in, in that photo right there. And in an interview with Jorge Duran Solorzano, the Ponte la del Metro co-founder, uh, he talked about how this confrontational situation became a funny thing and they de-escalated the confrontation through humor and this form of engagement helped manage how things turn out. And so prior where, for example, some sort of interaction where you're telling someone that they're doing something wrong could have led to fights, to more aggression, um, you know, to something else. Instead, people were kind of just laughing, realizing they did something wrong and then going, continuing to go about their day. Um, and that was kind of the reaction that, that this uh, 
that the co-founder Horhoi mentioned they uh, received a lot. And so I bring up these, um, these art kind of interventions um, because I think that there's a role for public art to play in creating safety and, and safe environments. And oftentimes I think it is really overlooked and maybe clowns or mimes aren't necessarily the most uh, relevant or applicable to where you are in your city, but it's important I think to think about what might be some more applicable um, interventions. And so some of my concluding thoughts are that these alternatives show a lot of promise. They're uh, in place in many different areas and they have shown to improve perceptions of safety and reduce overall um, crime or conflict. So I th when we're thinking about ways that we want to make our transit services safe um, and safe for everyone, uh, safe for the people who currently ride it, we really should be thinking about these alternatives and rethinking the way that we provide safety and security services on transit. So thank you very much for listening to my presentation. I hope that this was helpful and um, maybe you have some questions or got some questions answered. My email is down there below and I'd be happy to follow up if you have additional questions. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Mayan. I'm gonna jump in here. Uh, so, hey everyone, I'm Laura Raymond. I'm with ACT LA here in Los Angeles and uh, we've been working with Mayan um, on this research for a while. And I just wanted to, to talk a little bit about the campaign that we have here. Um, Cause as we know, you know, you can have the best research and best ideas, but then you gotta put it into, put it into place. So, um, I'm, I wanted to just back up and, and talk about kind of how ACT LA started uh, embarking on this work and uh, where we're at now and where we're going. Uh, so <clears throat> um, first of all, ACT LA, we're a coalition based in Los Angeles County. Um, we have 38 community organizations that are part of our coalition. Um, a lot of our members have worked on housing and, and tenant protections as kind of uh, the main focus of their work. We've got um, a lot of members that build affordable housing, um, that work with tenants um, on tenant rights campaigns. Um, we also have some policy organizations um, and some active transportation organizations like the Bike Coalition um, and things like that, um, but by and large, ACT LA started really focused on development around transit and affordable housing around transit. Um, and then in the last few years, I've really started focusing on transit justice in addition to our housing justice work as well. Um, and <clears throat> part of what where we began um, at LA Metro was working on a transit oriented communities policy at LA Metro um, after uh, Measure M passed, which was a, a massive sales tax um, that um, is funding a lot of our, our transit build out in LA at the moment. And so when Measure M passed, um, we went to the agency and we're like, look, uh, we are really, really concerned about displacement around transit. We need a transit oriented communities policy. And we started working on that. Um, and actually just last week, um, it finally our implementation plan passed and we're, we've got the transit oriented communities policy working. So that's been a long road. But along the way, we were really um, like every uh, kind of every proposal we were making, it was just Metro was telling us they didn't have the budget for this. Um, and same with just looking at service cuts um, on the bus and, and what was going on with bus service in the county. Metro has really been um, talking about like it's, it's tight budget. And yet in 2017, we saw a massive increase to the police budget. Um, and they, they went from a sheriff's, uh, a sheriff's contract to a multi-agency contract um, that's almost a billion dollars over, over five years. Um, and so we were, we were just really, um, really, really concerned about that budgeting choice. Um, and so ACT LA, even though we, we have not worked on um, policing issues in the past, and we, like I said, we've mostly been focused on housing justice, um, we knew we, we needed to take this on and we knew it was going to take a lot of um, coalition organizing to really push back against these policing contracts. So it's been a few years now that we've been working on developing out this campaign. And I just wanted to talk about like how we went about that as a coalition, because I know there's a lot of organizers on here that might that might be helpful for. So um, first, what we did was we partnered with the Center for Story Based Strategy, um, which is a group in Oakland. and. Uh, we, over the course of um, over a year, 
we did a number of different workshops and um, kind of visioning sessions with Center for Story-Based Strategy, um, which helped us kind of think about the vision that we wanted to be putting out there. Um, and, so, and this was with our members. So we had a lot of different um, all member meetings and then smaller meetings with community members and, and, and transit riders um, to come up with um, this, the, like our vision and like what would safety really look and feel like. Um, and so we came, it was, it was kind of a fun process. We came up with all these different creative ideas like Metro as a carnival, Metro as a spa, um, what would um, info centers and, and lights and street vendors look like if we really were um, activating our stations. And at, <clears throat> in the process, we came up with, I'm gonna uh, drop into the chat, our, our vision. Um, and this is kind of like our guiding light now that we talk about a lot is, is Metro as a sanctuary for the public. So we want the bus and the train to be fearless and consciously part of the city and integrated into people's daily lives and neighborhoods. Metro serves the public as libraries do, a public system where people go to feel safe, access information and receive a high level of service. Metro feels honored to serve youth of color and be a resource for all. LA is proud of how we've embraced a safe community serving and world-class transit system. So through that work, we um, thought about like what kind of, like what this would look like at different stations. Um, and then we knew um, with our, like we wanted to um, get our members excited and, and um, get out there and do some creative action. So we planned some activations um, where we actually built, built out what we wanted to see uh, at the transit um, stations and did these actions. And I'm pa pasting here um, some coverage of one of our actions with, where we um, had props and we um, spent the day at the station and we talked to riders as riders were coming in and out and asked them what they wanted to, to see for um, more of like a safe system and just did a lot of this kind of information gathering. Um, and one of the things that we've been really, really focused on as a campaign is making sure we're leaning into the idea of safety and we're not, um, we're not letting the law enforcement agencies kind of own that narrative, right? Like that we want a safe system and our, tra our transit rider members want a safe system. Um, and we're starting to talk outreach to unions and, and talk with um, the unions that are representing bus drivers and um, other folks that are on the system every day and see what, you know, what would make them feel more safe and, and really trying to center this idea of safety and reimagine safety. So we want, we um, want to have investment into things that will really make um, transit riders feel safe. And as Mayan covered, 88% of LA's transit riders are people of color. And what we've heard time and time again is that um, riders, particularly young black men on the system, feel very unsafe with the police contracts. And um, that is not a perception of safety that, that for, for uh, riders of color. And so we're doing a lot of this, like building off of um, what uh, Mayan just presented, we're doing a lot of really deep work around alternatives. So right now with ActLA, we have a committee that's building off the research Mayan did and, and looking at other examples. Um, we're, we're partnered with um, a veterans clinic at UCLA to, um, that's working with homeless vets on the system about like what resources do they need. Um, we're gonna reach out to service providers and really start having these conversations. Like what would a program on transit look like uh, for, for you, like, and how would you feel about that? And what would need to be in place? And make sure we're having all these conversations with um, providers in, in our county to, um, to really go to Metro with some, some um, concrete plans. Um, we're also working with Harvard Graduate School of Design around like design elements for um, like, what would a safe system, like what would be some design elements of, of the system itself, like physically? to improve perceptions of safety on the system. <clears throat> so we've kind of gathered a lot of different institutions as well as our members into a committee that's meeting very regularly. We're gonna put out um, a report at the end of no November. And this is all really gearing up to um, the kickoff of Metro's, um, Metro's own working group that was formed in June. So just backing up a little bit um, in June, amid the uprising in LA around racial justice, um, we were able to pass a, a motion at LA Metro's board 
to start a new working group to reimagine safety on the system. And they actually use those words to reimagine safety and to move money out of the police contracts. And we have our contracts up for renewal next year. So we're kicking into high gear right now to make sure that we're ready with like concrete proposals for when the contracts um, are up next year. Um, and uh, one other thing I'll mention just kind of before pausing for, for more discussion, but as a coalition that, um, just to kind of bring it back more to the organizing side of things, like as a coalition that where a lot of our members were focused um, on housing and, and tenant issues, um, we've really had to, we've really had to make sure we're supporting our members in getting funding and having the, um, the capacity to do <clears throat> more transit justice work and work on these issues. So kind of another arm of our work has been really um, doing capacity building both with um, our member organizations and their members. So we've been holding a lot of workshops around transit justice um, and um, also working with funders to try to get more funders to see um, this work as, as critical for racial justice work in the county as well as climate justice work as well. Um, and so we've been trying to, to just basically locate more funding for our members to, to be able to fundraise around this work and get supported to take on more of this work. Because as a coalition, um, we, we really are you know, only as active as our member organizations are, are involved. So that's been really important aspect of this as well. Um, and then one other thing I'll just name is, is some of the, um, so we've, we've got, um, we had Metro board pass this motion in June. So we do have um, some interest at the board level in exploring this issue. I do think we face like some, some challenges at, at really moving money out of the police contracts. And I think the biggest ones are one, like the political reality of our board is that um, our, our board is made up of mayors and well partially made up of mayors and the county board of supervisors um at the county sheriffs and um la and long beach are, are all getting these police contracts so it's a bit of it's a conflict of interest i would i would say around just they're you know they're going to be deciding the money for their own agencies um so that's a huge political challenge that we have um, the other thing is labor. Um, we, this is something we are committed to working on, but um, the, the unions that are currently working at Metro are concerned about um, having less police on the system. And so we, we are trying to build with them and um, just work on that, that issue. And um, again, just like really take seriously this concern about safety and say like, we're, we're coming up with alternatives and, and these are gonna be more effective. Um, and then some of our own members as well are just, um, you know, it's a, it's a new issue. And as transit riders, um, people want to know like, okay, if we're not going to have police, like, what are we going to have? And so we're doing that work internally as well. I'll just be real about that. Um, so, so I'll just pause there. Um, I was hoping you could hear, you know, what other cities are working on and um, what questions have come up for people, but i um, happy to be in conversation with you all about this work. Thanks, Laura. That was perfect timing. And also, what a great background. I feel like that uh, was a very helpful visual. Um, I want to just invite, I saw a couple questions in the chat, um, I think particularly around some of the uh, things that you had shared, Laura. I wonder if folks uh, have some questions, if we could queue those up now. Um, we're going to do, I think, a relatively short Q&A for a couple questions, and then we'll move into breakout groups. But this is a really great time to be able to ask Laura or Mayan, or even maybe ask one of the other partner cities in the group um, about some uh, particular piece that you want to know more about. And I would also ask, just so that we can keep it really smooth moving into breakout groups, if you haven't shared what breakout group you'd like to join, please just drop it in the chat, or you can message it to me um, individually. So um, I think I saw a question from Shannon around um, was it the safety and security working group or talking about the constituents that you had mentioned? Laura, Shannon, did you want to jump in? Sure. Yeah. I'm just curious how y'all maybe got that to happen. We, um, the, the safety and security working group in Denver, to my knowledge, is fairly new, um, but it's made up of just board members and folks that work for RTD. So I think 
like I want to immediately share with them that elsewhere community members can be on this group, which is what um, we were really hoping for. So would just love to hear maybe any strategy you had around that push. Yeah, well, fortunately, the, it was written into the motion and we had one of our champions write the motion. Um, so we just had, you know, that that um, political will from our champion to, to really make sure that it was um, constituents as well. Um, so it's going to be metro, there's going to be metro staff, including the chief of security. Um, but there's a application process, which I saw Maria um, put into the chat. Um, and in that, um, in the application, like you have to say, like you have to show that you're a transit rider and they have um, in the motion itself, I'll, I'll share the motion in a second, but they have um, that they want unhoused, like folks that have been unhoused and um, various different constituencies represented on the working group. Um, I see another question and um, Debbie Robert, if you want to go ahead and share that, out, you're welcome to um, come off of mute and share that, or I can go ahead and read your question for you. Just go ahead and read it. Okay, great. It's nice to hear some other voices in the chat. I mean, though I do love hearing my own. Um, so the question was, what attention has been paid to people with mental health challenges, and what are the promising responses other than law enforcement that have worked? Is there one non-law enforcement approach that seems better than the rest? Maya, do you want to take that? Yeah, yeah, I was I was kind of trying to find the unmute button um, on my screen. So I think that's a that's a really good question. Um, the scope of my research was limited to just um, examples in Los Angeles and in Phil or yeah in Philadelphia, um, and those showed a lot of promise in using um, nonprofits that were already providing service to people um, who ha were struggling uh, with addiction or um, kind of mental health issues, but that wasn't explicitly the, the focus of it. Um, and so those, yeah, those examples show a lot of promise and I, I, I'm sure there's other cities across the country that are doing similar types of interventions of specifically contracting out with nonprofits who are already doing that type of work to expand their service area to also be on transit. I hope I answered your question. And folks, um, we're gonna go ahead and, folks don't have to go ahead and chat. Uh, if people wanna just speak up and offer their question, you're welcome to. Um, we have about five, six more minutes before we move into breakout groups, so Go for it. I can wait a couple minutes. No one else has a question. I got a follow up question on the uh, elevator attendants. Um, I had a period earlier this year where I needed to, uh, I was, uh, had knee surgery and was recovering from it and became a cane user for a while. In fact, actually, everybody's temporarily able-bodied. Eventually, everyone becomes uh, somewhat disabled. And the challenge I found where there were elevators that were working were uh, they weren't the most pleasant environment to be in and I wondered in the cities where there are elevator attendants is just uh, you know just having a presence there or do they have any um, maintenance type of responsibilities uh, uh, along with that. Yeah, from what I understand, they're they're just a presence. Um, I'm, I don't think they have any maintenance responsibilities but the case in um, BART and in uh, SF Muni, the, these two agencies share elevators, so they kind of did this contract together. They, they reduced instances of urination and defecation um, and drug use in elevators, I think by 98%. It was something really kind of overwhelmingly so. Um, 
and so when you have a presence, perhaps there's also not as much of a need for maintenance staff to come in um, into those elevator spaces as well. Yeah, and I think to Maria's point too about um, a lack of public restrooms in transit stations, um, in speaking with um, the Latifa Simon from the BART Board of Directors on this topic, um, she had mentioned that there are policies in place which limit the amount of restrooms that transit agencies can have. This was kind of a like a, a anti or like security kind of measure after 9-11 to reduce public spaces, I guess, or like confined spaces in um, in transit. But if you know, maybe that's that's worth revisiting around if that policy is still relevant and necessary. Um, because that is a limiting factor of being able to build restrooms, at least in underground spaces. I have a question for Laura, actually. I'm wondering, Laura, if um, you found it challenging to um, get funding from philanthropy or others to support your advocacy and the research work around this, because it it is like a really important topic, but it's kind of you know, cutting edge for, for philanthropy and transit folks to be thinking about. So I'm, I'm curious what that experience was like and if you have any tips for others. Yeah, um, so it's a work in progress. <laughs> um, we have, you know, we have gotten some interest um, from some of our funders in like in LA that just know ACT LA and um, see us as kind of like building movement generally. So I, I would say like, I don't know that it's necessarily even connected to like this issue specifically, um, but they're excited where we're, that we're, we're bringing people together um, around transit justice and racial justice on transit. Um, so, uh, but I, I would say like, one of the things that's been really challenging is just getting, getting funding for our members to do base building around this issue. Um, so that's really beyond just kind of funding the coalition um, staff, uh, just trying to really um, organize funders to fund base building, which is really what we need because um, we've got, you know, we've got staff from various organizations that are really interested in this, but what we, what we're, we're doing is building an, or our organizing committee is building a transit rider base. So um, identifying who at our member organizations in their membership depends on transit. Um, and then we, we've created a space for all those organizations to come together um, through our organizing committee. And we've got, um, we had an assemblea this summer um, where they really kind of um, decided on what our platform was going to be at Metro. Um, and so it's just like a lot, I mean, as anyone who's done organizing knows, it's a lot of work um, for organizers to do, like kind of build out a new area of their work um, and then involve people at, a, at, at like a coalition level um, that's in a sustained com campaign. So they really just need funding to be able to do that. So, you know, as kind of at the coalition level, we've, like, we've been working with EDs and other folks that do fundraising for our member organizations to support them in fundraising around kind of this shared shared work plan and um, shared vision. Um, so I would say you know we've had some luck so far, but um, we have we definitely have more work to do because we we do have members that are doing this work with you know they're not being funded to do it, so um, it's not sustainable in the long run to to um, not have kind of that. Um, just like the shared funding going in. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question from Leah, or I'm happy to also read it, but um, I think you may have to hop. So if you want to jump in and read this question, I think it's a really good one. Let me double mute. Um, yeah, no, just one of the things that CTA has heard, I would say relatively loudly is just that people feel safer around other people um, and that having enough um, critical mass is important. And I'm just wondering if any of the strategies that people have looked at have also considered how to get at that piece of this. You know, I mean, obviously there's growing ridership and reducing 
fares or creating a system that didn't require fares would be um, an interesting way to approach that. But I'm just wondering, practically speaking. Yeah, I can start off and Mayan, if you have any thoughts on this, but um, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the biggest things we hear is people like when they're, when, you know, Metro is like asking about people feeling unsafe. It's like when they're waiting at the stop and it's a poorly lit stop and it's, you know, the bus is a half an hour late and there's no one around. So um, that is definitely what we're hearing. Uh, so a few of the things we've been looking at is, um, one, like just activating the stations with more people. So um, we've got a really active street vendor campaign here in LA that um, there's a lot of overlap between people that organize with the street vendor campaign and people that organize with Act LA. And so we're <clears throat> actually in the motion, which I put into the chat, they mentioned, they even mentioned street vendors, like having a space at the stations for um, vending, which we currently don't have. Um, and then just like more janitorial staff, um, and more, um, yeah, the transit ambassador program is an obvious one. Um, just having more of that presence. Um, and then also, as you said, like just growing ridership. So there's more, there's more people in the system, there's more people around. And we do think free fares is, is a key way in LA to do that. Um, and um, the, other, the other critical part of this conversation is improving service, right? Because um, the, the bus here is so unreliable that like you could be, if you miss a bus, like you could be waiting for 45 minutes for the next one. Um, and so just having that like reliability that people know, like when they can, they can go down to the stop and it'll be here in however many, many minutes increases safety, right? So we're, we're really making that push. And just the context we're in right now is that Metro is actually implementing service cuts. Like we've got 20% service cuts on our, on our bus system. Um, during COVID-19 and they in September just made those, um, you know, they wrote those service cuts into this year's budget, which <clears throat> is a huge thing we're pushing back against. Because um, if we're talking about safety, right, like safety right now means like no crowding on the buses and making sure people um, can get where they need to go to do the essential work that they're doing um, as essential workers in LA. So, um, you know, we're, we think like what Metro is doing is actually increasing like they're, they're perpetuating a lack of safety through, um, you know, in increasing crowding and things like that on the, on the system. Yeah, and just one other or two other things to add on that from uh, existing research as well is that there, there's been um, some studies around like the siting of bus stop locations and that bus stops that are, are kind of in, put in place um, adjacent to uh, like a, a business that has a lot of turnover, like a, a store or something like that, uh, they tend to be safer and have less crime because there's more people walking around and kind of like traffic in the area. Um, and then another another study that I, I don't think I actually mentioned this, but um, that's also pretty interesting and important to think about is how is like neighborhood trust and how um, when you have trust in your neighborhood and when you feel more comfortable on strangers um, that also increases safety and so there's I think different initiatives that can be taken to create more of like a sense of community on transit as well um, in order to kind of get at that so two, th two other things to, to think about too. Thanks you guys. Um, Linda did you want to offer your question next on transit ambassadors? Sure. Um, yeah I guess I've been wondering um, in Chicago, we've been talking a lot about alternatives to policing on transit. So I'm wondering how ambassadors are being framed around um, kind of like the larger conversation around defund police. Are, are ambassadors uh, like an abolition, abolitionist approach or are they intended to work alongside police to meet the needs of transit riders? So I think those, are, those differences are important to acknowledge because um, I think I'm interested at transit ambassadors if they are alternatives to police. I'm not as interested in ambassadors um, if if they are leading to no reduction in the number of police in our transit systems because I don't think it's addressing some of the root problems that which is the excessive presence of police on transit. So I'm wondering some of the thoughts around that. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good question, and it gets to kind of how how they're how these programs are housed in a transit agency as well. So 
Um, I'll start with the SFMTA example because I think that that definitely falls under more of an abolitionist program because it's not housed through the police department or has any sort of contact with the police department. The ambassadors are closely linked to the schools and so they'll actually, um, that program is aimed at reducing like youth altercations and so these ambassadors will go to a school that they're kind of reporting to in the morning, get a sense of what might be some of the issues um, in that school that are coming up right now, any if there was like incidents during the day, and then they'll actually ride the transit lines leading to and from the school after school mainly. And so they're, they're really like separated from the police in that way. And they, they don't like um, de-escalate things by referring to police officers or calling in police officers for backup. They're kind of on their own. Um, and then we can compare that to the BART program, which for the BART program, um, because of issues around uh, union classification, those transit ambassadors are actually housed under the BART police department. And so they're, they're classified as community service officers. And these community service officers previously were officers um, unarmed who were patrolling parking lots to make sure that nothing was going on in the BART parking lots. And so that's, they kind of were able to take that classification and then merge that onto transit. But for their position, they're brought on as, as a way to kind of like report issues up to police, up to the police officers if necessary. Um, and so that's kind of, I think like when we're, we're thinking about how to frame these programs and how to structure these programs, there's different ways of creating them and different ways of housing them. And I think that leads to, to your question and to the overall outcome as well. And I hope I answered that. Uh, if I could, I wanted to jump in on a semi follow up to this discussion and somebody mentioned, uh, I can't see it now in chat about the CTA and the UPASS and the perception of high school versus college students. And you were talking about the uh, program that was based in the schools. So are the people that were doing that, are they the peers of the students in the schools or are they like uh, uh, young adults or adults? Uh, because um, uh, I think pe uh, young people have an interest in public safety, but that interest isn't in more police. Um, in the, the program in San Francisco was aimed, I believe, at high schoolers. I don't know who exactly were, like, the, the folks who were getting into fights, but it, it's been in place since the late 90s. Uh, it's a really long-running program, and, I, and it, then it started as, as, like, a high school-aimed program, and I think now it's expanded to both middle schools and high schools, and they're hoping to actually expand it further to include like after school activities, um, like football games and events and things like that too. Um, I think that was a question. Uh, originally someone had shared around uh, CTA and then I, so I, we, may be, we may be pulling in all of our uh, Spark Metro systems in there. Yeah, I could speak one more thing to that CTA. I, mean, I was with CTA about 20 years ago. I'm, I'm with the city of Chicago now, but uh, hi to all the CTA colleagues on the line. <laughs> um, that what, what Another interesting thing that was uh, discovered back then in, in market research is that um, people felt that the high school students were on better behavior the more college students were on the bus or on the train too. There were like these very interesting dynamics going on with, again, this sort of self-regulation of behavior in a, in a positive way. And uh, so it was an interesting way that sort of fair policy, which is what the UPASS ended up being, kind of gets back to, you know, the, the, the mix of, of, of customers and how they all behave one another in hopefully in positive ways. Sounds like we may not have too much more to add on that question, but I really appreciate people kind of filling in uh, some of the other questions that came up in the group. Um, I think we have time for just about one more question. Um, Rylan, did you wanna 
share that last question? Yeah, sure. Um, would I be able to share my comment as well or just the question? Oh yeah, please feel free. Okay, um, yeah, but I was wondering, um, just a general consensus of everyone on the call, were people feeling that preventative or reactionary methods would be best in dealing with safety and concerns around disenfranchised folks? And then more of a comment, not really a question. Um, Chicago has a lot of homeless individuals who utilize the CTA, and my experience has mostly been um, buses, train stations, and the trains themselves as a safe space for themselves. Um, because of various issues going on with shelters around the city, from a capacity standpoint, from a treatment standpoint, to them no back. Excuse me, sorry. To them not feeling comfortable with utilizing that space for a lot of reasons. So I think that even though it it kind of diverts from the main point that we are trying to like address, um, I don't think that we'll be able to address it without also addressing that. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Um, and that's one of the, that's actually kind of how, how I was talking about how we got into this is working on transit oriented communities. Um, I think ultimately, you know, ACT LA, we're, we're really committed to seeing housing, permanent housing solutions. And, and we do think LA Metro has a role in that. Um, and we've, you know, we've charted that out with the agency on how that can look. And now it's a question of budget. Um, and so I think in the long term, yes, absolutely, like we think holistic measures to create real lasting safety for communities is, is absolutely what we need to do. Um, and it's, it's really kind of a conversation that the whole region's going through right now as we're in this enormous crisis of, of lack of housing um, and lack of good uh, affordable housing options. Um, where we have 54,000 people without homes um, in our county, um, and many, many of them live on live on the trains and live on the buses and live in the stations. Um, and we like any 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 conversation with Metro staff around police. This is a, like part of the context, right? Is there? They're actually. I I really think that like the probably the number one motivation of Metro to increase policing contracts is because of unhoused people. And they'll, they, they basically say as much to us um, that, you know, they're afraid if they cut the contracts, they won't have police to kick people off the trains and buses, um, just to be frank. I mean, that is what they, they say to us. And so we know that that is not a solution for unhoused people. And it's actually contributes to criminalization, marginalization, and makes the situation worse. And so we're really invested in figuring out how are, what are the long-term safety solutions um, and things like Mayan's bringing up, like there's, there's other systems that do have um, service centers where people can go in the stations themselves. Um, we know that things like the, the PATH program um, that Metro has is much more effective in connecting people with solutions um, than LAPD. So we we're building this data um, and we, we think like there's, there's like, there's much better um, ways to approach unhoused people on the system and actually be a resource. Um, and in the long term, we want uh, Metro to really invest resources in transit oriented communities, um, affordable housing. Um, it owns a lot of land in the region. And um, so, so that's our transit oriented communities policy, right? And the problem there is they're not putting enough budget or resources towards that. Um, so it's really, for us, it becomes like this budgetary um, issue with how Metro is approaching, you know, the overall system. So anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. I don't want to cut us short because I know that people still have more questions and want to dig in more, but I think that's actually a great transition place for us to jump into breakout groups. Well, we really cut off Amari, who was in mid-sentence when we were cut off. So if she would like to continue her thought, and then we can pretty much say that things focused on me as a person that uses a wheelchair as far as being accessible. But we agreed that for something to be accessible for me, it would make things better for everyone. Yeah, so um, I will go ahead and um, give our debrief. I, uh, my group was built infrastructure um, and just kind of questioning how do we change and make um, things better. And so some of the things we talked about is really defining um, 
you know, this accessibility definitions, just it's not always um, disabled, but those who are visually or um, deaf and um, how do we improve both stations and their riding experience, um, whether that's having, um, you know, someone speaking on a loudspeaker or putting signage in the exact same locations, um, you know, everywhere throughout the station, things like that. Um, so really, really considering all types um, of accessibility in terms of that definition and defining. Um, and then we also discussed just inequities within our transit um, systems. And so um, when I say Rylan was speaking to, as well as myself, um, how different things are in the north and south sides of Atlanta and Chicago um, and access to, to stations, whether that's uh, sidewalks or um, catching a bus, things like that. Um, and so just infrastructure improvements and um, kind of bus signage and bus functionality. How do we, how do we change that and make it more equitable um, on all sides or areas, so. Thanks, Mari. I, I think that was really helpful. And, and Kristen also to just bring in kind of what the lived experience uh, you know, this group is centered on. Um, do other groups want to share? Um, sure. This is Maggie from Mile High Connects in Denver. Um, I can share a little bit about our conversation. Um, we were focused on the mental and support staff and um, mental health and support staff uh, in terms of safety and perception of such on, on uh, transit. And we had the opportunity to speak with two representatives from RTD, our regional transportation district, um, the executive director of the board of directors and the transit equity specialist. Um, and so we talked about RTD having recently created an ad hoc committee for safety and security um, that was really born out of more, a more uh, uh, specific focus on the code of conduct, especially in the context of COVID and the national racial reckoning that we're experiencing, really changing that model. And I think what I'm most excited to tell this group is that RTD recently engaged in trainings with their security officers, with two community partners on structural racism, implicit bias. And it seems like the, um, the transit safety officers were really um, hungry for that type of information and wanting to know more. Um, so that's certainly something that is happening out here in Denver. Um, and I'll open it up to my other um, group members in case they wanna jump in on anything. I'm otherwise complete and thank you. Yeah, I just, I put this in the chat and I just wanted to clarify that it was transit police um, and not the transit security officers. And just, um, we have to look at the contract really more um, in depth to really understand our limitations, like uh, between our contracted services and what kind of breaches that, oh, well, now you're an RTD employee. And so why are we doing trainings for you? And all those legal fun things, you know, you have to work through. And so, um, but I definitely think that um, the, the trainings were impactful. And I think that to further the, just the trainings to bring along conversations and bring community members together would be another helpful step forward. So just a little addition, and I might have to hop off here because I, I have a 12 o'clock, I'm in Mountain Standard Time, but it was really great to be a part of this. So thank you all. Thanks, Kimberly. And, and just with an eye on time, because I know we're running a few minutes over, what would be great is, um, Philip, do you want to share? And then if other groups, unless you're really excited, could actually go ahead and post maybe a quick summary in the chat. Um, and then we'll also take a, take a little bit of the notes um, that we've got and maybe try to share them back in a helpful way with you all as well. Yeah, I'll be quick. So we were up in Chicago, uh, Atlanta, and the Bay Area. Uh, for Chicago, we talked a bit of just about how when the CTA rebuilt the Green Line, um, they included these spaces for retail and other activities, but didn't have a lot of success in filling them and how that's been like a consistent issue, um, as well as like elevators not being well maintained, so people don't want to use them. 
And the CTA is an example that's pretty police heavy as opposed to some of these other alternative type programs. Um, and then just with Bay Area talked a bit, I just mentioned the example of uh, Nia Wilson, who is very public, um, brutally killed on, on BART as a really visible and um, visceral kind of example um, and sort of the intersection of mental health and, and racism is, is creating particular dangers for black folks in particular. Um, but that also recognizing that police don't really necessarily stop those kind of things from happening. Um, and then lastly, Atlanta, uh, Odetta brought an example of this thing called, I think it was called Soccer in the Streets, setting up uh, soccer games right by MARTA stations as a way to reduce um, crime and drug dealing right around uh, stations. So those are just a couple examples. And then last thing was we talked about how police sometimes actually stop activities that would be helpful for creating the feeling of safety. So like street vending, music, art, stuff like that, that law enforcement often is an obstacle for that. Yep, thank you so much, um, Philip. That was super helpful. If folks have other highlights, oh, thank you, uh, Jorge Ivan. It'd be great to just um, keep this in the chat so that other folks can see what's coming up from the other breakout groups. On that note, I'm gonna keep the wrap up and next steps really quick because we're over time to just offer um, that we will definitely share the report, slides, and as many of the links in the chat. Um, I think we can share all the links in the chat. And there is an opportunity for us to kind of connect more in conversation. Uh, we have a Spark Community of Practice um, platform where um, we'll send you an email and you have free access to go ahead and join and just continue this conversation with some of the speakers. And we'll also house all the resources there. So hopefully that will be a really great way to just continue the conversation and you know dig in deeper to some of these great topics. So with that, I'm gonna say, Thank you so much to everyone. Thank you to Laura, Mayan, uh, the ETOD working group who really pulled uh, this idea together and um, have a great rest of the day.